This lecture will provide an introduction to the plants of the valley that leads from Wolong in Sichuan, China, up towards the pass through the Balang Shan, the Balang Mountains. It will provide an introduction to amazingly rich diversity of plants in southwest China, mainly focusing on herbaceous plants, especially in the higher alpine meadows, but with one or two orchids thrown in too. Wolong is perhaps best known valley in Sichuan because of its association with the giant panda. It is now incorporated into the giant panda national park, which has an area three times as large as Yellowstone National Park in the USA, although some conservationists have argued that the money spent on conserving the giant panda could have been better spent, it is hard to deny the value if one views it in the context of protecting a stunningly beautiful region with a natural history that is one of the richest and most diverse in China. We will focus on the plants, of course. However, keep in mind that this protected habitat is also home to the delightful red panda and a wide range of other mammals, including the snow leopard, which has been recorded here in camera traps at altitudes above 4,000 metres. Wolong is in Wenchuan County, a region that was devastated in the 2008 earthquake. The famous panda breeding centre has been rebuilt since then, and visitor numbers have built up, but it's not as big a tourist centre as some of the sites further north. Plan for a three-hour drive uh, from Chengdu, and as far as I'm aware, the accommodation is still quite basic. Uh, we will mostly explore the high reaches of the, the valley, climbing up towards the Balang Shan La, that's the pass of the Balang um, um, highlighted there, you can see the, the wiggly roads as it climbs up, uh, a very steep climb up the side of the mountain, um, uh, going uh, a distance of, uh, an altitude distance of around about a, a thousand metres in quite a short space of, of distance. The valley floor at around the altitude of the Panda Breeding Centre, that's around 1900 metres above sea level, is very fertile and a valuable resource for those living in the area. The Yuzha River at this stage of its journey down to the Minchu is only crossable by a quite exciting rope road, but the walk across is well worth while with an abundance of plants to explore on either side. Arisema consanguinium is a strongly architectural plant, uh, but the west wet flushes also provide a mass of Corydalis flexuosa, now introduced into cultivation in some quite distinctive named forms in uh, different shades of, of electric blue. Continuing to climb gently along the river valley, a variety of particularis can be found in wet alluvial soils where the parasitic nature gives them an early advantage in the absence of stronger competition. They're pretty things, so it is perhaps a bit unfortunate that the historic belief that they were responsible for infestations of life, lice, if eaten by livestock, gives them the vernacular of louse work and their generic name for from particulars meaning louse. Uh, there are some 352 species accepted in China, so IDing down to species can be a bit of a specialist occupation. Orchids, on the other hand, are a little bit easier, even if they do vie with compositi for the largest plant family. This is Calanthe tricarinata, a widespread terrestrial orchid on the mountains of Asia. It is a woodland plant with moist shade suiting it well. Calanthes don't seem to be too challenging in cultivation in light shade and moist but free draining compost. We're still at around the 2000 metre mark, although the road is starting to ascend a little more steeply. The narrowing of the Yuzi Chu with a little less runoff from the valley side is beginning to get noticeable. There are some wonderful little woodland groves on either side of the road. Here we see Primula polynura, which is in section Cortus, Cortusoides, with uh, the very characteristic leaves branching from the midrib. Uh, Primula siboldii is probably the most familiar from this section with its tremendous diversity of cultivars following its enthusiastic, almost cult following in Japan. Like Primula siboldii, Primula polynura is very variable in the wild. Uh, perhaps not quite so variable as Siboldii. Um, this one is a good strong colour uh, at the deeper end of the range from soft pink to a more strident colour such as this one. 
it is straightforward to grow in the garden as Primula Siboldii like shade and a little bit moist during the growing season. I think you can see what it likes in this picture. There are some fine shrubs too. Um, as you can see growing around it in, 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 the, in this image. Um, Syringa comeroii subspecies reflexa is a real gem. Um, it is described in Hillier's Manual of Trees and Shrubs as a large shrub of considerable quality with white insides and more open corolla, giving it an edge over the nominate species. It was discovered and introduced by Ernest Wilson in 1904, although the designation Komarov was published by the German botanist and landscape architect, architect C.K. Schneider. Unfortunately, the use of a commemorative name Komarov leaves one guessing its background. Uh, Komarov is a town in Poland, the scene of an important battle in 1920, and Schneider had some connections with Poland, but this is only guessing, really. Moving on, the climb is getting a little steeper and we're now at about 2,200 metres above sea level. We're moving up into the zone with more higher altitude plants. I'll come back to Primula involucrata subspecies Yargonensis shortly when we can see it in more characteristic form, uh, but we've certainly reached the Goldilocks zone for slipper orchids. I somehow think of these as iconic plants of the mountains of uh, southwest China. Always a buzz of excitement when finding one. Of course, they always have a slipper-like lip, but there is such a diversity of size and form. This is Cypripedium franchetii, one of the more robust ones. The name commemorates Adrian René Franchet, the 19th century taxonomist who was a major contributor to describing the collections made by the French Catholic missionaries in China. Continuing up, uh, the, the river is now crossable by foot with care. The alluvial soils are still a good habit for Particularis. This one is Particularis Davidi, named for Père David, one of the French missionaries that Franchet worked so closely with. Quite a distinctive and substantial plant, this one, growing up to 30 centimetres tall. In contrast, small annual gentians can be found amongst the rocks where the riverbank is a bit more stable. Uh, Gentiana rubicunda was named by Franchet, although the red, ruddy red of the specific name doesn't quite get it right. It is more purple to my eye. Further into shade, and we find Paris polyphylla, another widespread plant of the Himalaya mountains of Asia. It is a handsome architectural plant. Further into shade, and we find uh, more terrestrial orchids. This one is a little bit easy to miss, or oh, contrast, a little bit hard to spot. Uh, <coughs> Ori Ori Orchis foliosa var indica is clearly trying to hide itself away with the dark stem, sepals and petals of var indica making it quite uh, or seriously hard spot in scrubby shade. Uh, but an attractive little thing nevertheless. After this gentle rise along the river valley the road starts a more severe zigzag up on the mountain slide. Bad weather produces some very atmospheric scenes as we work up to around the 3,000 metre mark and start to climb into the alpine zone. The plants look a tad bedraggled in the wet, uh, but this is taking us, is in, taking us into a quite, quite special place. China is well known for having provided so much material for breeding roses for our gardens. Um, this is Peony Vici, I, I forgot to mention. Um, uh, but it's also an, an important centre for peonies, perhaps even more important for the Chinese culture than for the West at the moment. Peony Vicia is named to commemorate one of the most important nurseries, of course, and nurserymen of the 19th century. <coughs> but we're, we're also in the habitat for one of the more challenging species growing in the West, uh, well, the, uh, to grow in the West. Um, 
Whilst the land of the blue poppy commemorates the wonderful blue shades, Mechanopsis integrifolia provides rays of sunshine on a rainy day like this one. Uh, the blue poppies will appear at a slightly higher altitude. We're still in the Goldilocks zone for slipper orchids, and Cypripedium tibeticum shows its deeper coloured flowers than Cypripedium franchetti. This is generally a more robust plant than Cypripedium franchetti, although this particular plant seems to be subdued a bit by the very exposed growing conditions. Now we can find Primula involucrata subspecies Yargonensis as an individual specimen. Subspecies Involucrata has white to pale pink flowers and is found widely in the Himalayan southern Tibet. It was introduced into cultivation by William Munro in 1845, with subspecies Yargonensis being introduced by Wilson in 1903. The latter is perhaps the more garden-worthy plant, as you can see here. Uh, although the specific epithet Involucrata is widely used, there, are, there is some doubt about its validity. Um, and I note that Kew's Plants of the World Online and some nurseries refer to this plant as Primula munroi, uh, subspecies Yargonensis, uh, which would also make the nominate subspecies Primula munroi, subspecies munroi. When browsing through various books on Chinese plants, one so wishes one could see even more of the treasures. There are some really beautiful primulas to be seen in Christopher Gray Wilson and Philip Cribb's Guide to the Flowers of Western China, for example. Uh, but this plant is arguably the most beautiful of them all. I've seen a well-respected botanist dancing across a meadow and punching the air with his hand after a sighting of Omphalogramma vin florum. Uh, sometimes Omphalogramma has been merged into Primula, um, and so this becomes Primula vinci flora, uh, but the six lobes of the corolla compared with Primula's five do seem to clearly distinguish it, uh, um, 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 on in general. Um, although this is not so clear in this pi picture, um, uh, uh, it, tr trust me, it does have six petals. It is a bit picky about where it grows in the wild, hence the excitement of finding it. But unless you can simulate a damp, high-altitude meadow, I understand it is a challenge to grow. Back in the mid-1980s, the road up to the Balang Shan La was a challenge to the nervous. Single track and slipping away into the abyss in places, with convoys of logging lorries emerging out of the mist at short notice. Uh, the road is much more stable now, and makes the higher-altitude meadows much more accessible. Here one can find Rosa Schwegenzoei in light scrubby fringes. Uh, this is similar to the better known Rosa Moisei but with clustered pink flowers. In the meadows uh, two veratrums stand, <coughs> stand out as bold architectural plants. Veratrum nigrum on the left and Veratrum grandiflorum on the right. There's also a new orchid here, um, uh, although small flowered, uh, Satyrium ciliatum is quite a robust plant growing up to about 30 centimetres tall. Herbaceous phlomis are represented here by Phlomis melanantha um, and then climbing a bit higher provides some stunning views and at about 3,200 metres, some alpine meadows rich in the deep blue of Iris chrysographies. These are amazingly rich meadows with such a diversity of plants and insects. Uh, they almost defy belief and certainly want, warrant days of study and not just a few hours, which may be the most most visitors can, can afford. Um, from Campanulaceae, uh, Codonopsis nervosa raises its flowers above the mass on a scape some 50 centimetres tall. They dance about in the slightest breeze. Uh, notice also the hint of purple in the calyx and scape. Orchids are here too, with Ponorochis chusua tucked a little deeper into the herbaceous layer.
This is quite a widespread little orchid, ranging from Siberia down to the mountains of Asia, and covering an altitude range increasing from 500 to 4,700 metres as its range extends from north to south, fairly typical of, of um, plants that cross into the Arctic Circle. Now we are a bit higher at just above 3,400 metres, and the poppies are indeed blue, uh, something to look into here about this difference. This is Mechanopsis rudis, a slightly bristly plant. Uh, presumably this and especially the dark pimples on the leaves are what uh, led to the designation rudis, meaning rough. It prefers, as here, rocky meadows and screes. The plants in this area have been referred to Mechanopsis balangensis, but I'm not sure that this has any validity as a distinction from Mechanopsis rudis. The hairs on Mechanopsis lancifolia are softer, so it can be put in a different group to the previous plant. It is also a much smaller plant, and usually with much more red in the flower colour to give violet blue um, to, as here, purple flowers. Back to primulas, and section Sicimensis is represented here by Primula albicola. Uh, this is a less robust plant than Primula sicimensis, and the more open hat-like corolla also distinguishes it. Uh, this was interesting to see as the aforementioned guide to the flowers of southwest China, and also John Richard's book, refer to its distribution as southeast Tibet, uh, so um, perhaps its distribution is a bit more broad than that, and there's certainly plenty to discover in the intervegin, intervening region. Um, you might notice in the background what looks like a flower of a geranium, so let's have a look at that. This is geranium pogonanthum and is a very handsome plant indeed. The slightly marbled leaves show off the nodding paired flowers with the strong form and colour contrast between the white recurved petals and the bluish black anthers. The flower colour ranges through pink to quite a deep purple, named by Franchette as having bearded barbs, uh, presumably referring to the dense hairs at the base of the corolla. Um, it's rare in cultivation for some reason, but would make a really handsome front border plant. Let's finish with a familiar plant. Aster Himalaicus is always a joy to see and not at all difficult to grow at home. Certainly very widespread, which uh, perhaps again supports the, uh, the relative straightforwardness of, of growing it. Well, that has been quite a journey, and this was just the first part of the road up to the Balang Shala at around 4,700 metres above sea level, so plenty more to, to be seen. An 8.3 kilometre tunnel speeds the onward journey through the higher altitudes for the commercial traffic, but it does make access to the heights harder for the naturalist. Um, hopefully, what you've seen in this lecture has given you some impression of the wonderful scenery and natural history of this extensive area. Thank you.